Well, good morning. On Thanksgiving morning, I was invited to um, play basketball early with some other pastors and leaders around the city, and so I got up real early, and we got a couple games in before breakfast, and um, one of the people on the court was introducing me to someone else, and they said, this is Bob Thune, he's the pastor at Quorum Deo, and the other person said to me, man, your church is amazing. Every time I meet someone from Quorum Deo, I'm just really impressed. Um, You guys have really good people. And so I just want you guys to know, that's your reputation in the city, and that's encouraging. I love hearing stories like that from other people who have encountered you and say, man, these are are great people. Um, So I hope you're encouraged by that. And I want you to know, uh, for me, that's exciting because it it means to me that God is answering um, one of the prayers I've always had for our church, and that is, I've always prayed that this would be a a community of change, Um, that this would be a church where we really are changing and becoming more like Christ, and where that is evident to people around us, where as they experience us, they experience people who are being changed and growing to be more like Jesus. And so when I hear stories like that, it makes me say, thank you, God. Um, You're at work among us. You're you're doing the things uh, we're hoping for and asking for. So even as we think about change this morning, I hope that story sort of encourages you that God's at work, right? God is changing you, changing me, changing us. Now, before we um, transition to the sermon text this morning, uh, let me briefly remind you of an invitation that I've been uh, extending to you in the weekly update videos the past couple of weeks. I want to invite you to join me in fasting from social media during Advent. Um, Next Sunday, December 3rd, marks the beginning of the Advent season. There are four Sundays in Advent, and so that means the final Sunday is Christmas Eve. And so for that span of time, from December 3rd until Christmas, uh, I want to invite you to join me in shutting down social media. I don't mean just not posting on social media. I mean actually just getting away from it for four weeks or so. Shutting down Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and whatever else you might have and use. Um, Here's the deal. Advent is a season of simplicity. Um, It's a season of waiting and a season of worshipful anticipation. And it's an appropriate time for us to sort of cut out the chatter and the noise that marks so much of our existence. And a lot of that, honestly, comes to us through the always open channel of social media. And as a pastor, I'm concerned about the formative effect that social media has on our souls. Um, Rather than becoming people who are experts in prayer and scripture, I wonder whether we are becoming people who are experts in outrage and in celebrity gossip. Um, rather than cultivating peace, I wonder if we're cultivating anxiety and unrest. And, and rather than learning wisdom, I wonder if we're learning foolishness and superficiality. And, and so I want to invite you, starting next Sunday, to, to just step away from all of it for three or four weeks uh, until Christmas. And I want to invite you to do whatever that takes. For some of you, that means um, removing the apps from your phone. For some of you, that means suspending your accounts entirely. For some of you, that means a little bit of accountability with your close friends. Um, Whatever it takes for you, I want to invite you into this. And here's what you're going to notice as you do this. You're going to notice how many times in your day you go to social media for some sort of interaction. You're going to notice how full your life is of little distractions. Like, what are you going to do now when you're standing in line at the store? Or when you're stuck in an airport, or whether you're waiting to pick the kids up from school in the carpool line, like, what are you going to do with that 30 seconds? Well, maybe you'll use it to pray. Maybe you'll just enjoy being bored. That's what we used to do before social media, right? Just enjoy, like, a little bit of mindlessness, a little bit of silence, a little bit of space. And I hope what that will do is to sort of... um, provoke us with how distracted our lives have become and maybe help us to reorient so that we can pick back up our engagement with the online world in a way that's a little more balanced, a little more centered, um, a little more grounded. All right, so 
that's my invitation for you uh, as we head into Advent next week. Now, we've been spending this month building out a theology of sanctification. Uh, the series is called How We Change. And so we've been sort of building it around four big ideas. Uh, first of all, that change is slow work. It's the work of sowing and reaping. That's Galatians chapter 6. Uh, second, that change is heart work. That it's not about the fruit, but it's about the root. That's Luke chapter 6. Uh, third, that change is God's work. Philippians chapter 2. And finally, we want to explore the idea that change is your work. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, every counselor, everyone who works with people uh, in pursuit of change, uh, has dealt with people who come seeking input, but who don't seem willing to do the work required for change. In fact, this is so common that in 2002, a research psychologist at Johns Hopkins University wrote a book about it. The book is called Therapy with Difficult Clients. Hopefully you're not a case study in the book, right? Um, The author maintains that before change can occur, there are seven precursors that have to be in place. Here they are. Number one, a person has to have a sense of urgency or need. Number two, they have to have a willingness to experience anxiety or difficulty. Number three, they have to have awareness that a problem exists. Number four, they have to be willing to confront the problem. Number five, they need effort or will toward change. Number six, they need hope that they can change. And number seven, they need social support for change. I want you to notice especially number five. This is a common sense observation. If we want to change, it's going to require effort or will or intentionality toward change. In other words, if you do nothing, Nothing's going to change, right? Um, And as usual, in observing this, in saying this, social science is just reiterating and rediscovering the age-old wisdom of the Bible. Uh, But before the folks at Johns Hopkins knew this, God knew this. Uh, He's been telling us this for thousands of years. Change requires effort. It requires willpower on our part. We have to be willing to do the work of change. And so as we conclude this series this morning, uh, we want to talk about the idea that change is your work. Now remember, this is founded upon everything we've already said. For the past three weeks, we've been talking about how change is God's work, and change is slow work, and change is heart work. So let's not forget all of that, but let's also emphasize the obvious reality that change requires our will, our effort. So to close out this series, let's look again at Philippians 2, 12 and 13, the same text that we studied last week. Um, You've already heard it read, and I want to focus specifically on the command in Philippians 2, verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I want you to notice this is an imperative, this is a command, it's telling us what we ought to to do. We ought to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And so I want us to consider three things this morning. I want us to observe the starkness of this command, the substance of this command, and the secret of this command. All right? The starkness of it, the substance of it, the secret of it. So let's explore, first of all, the starkness of this command. Here's what I mean. Um, The Greek word that's translated work out in verse 12 means, here are some synonyms, accomplish, achieve, produce, bring about. So, So the verse literally reads, accomplish your own salvation. Achieve your own salvation. Bring about your own salvation. Does that trouble you? I mean, I hope it kind of troubles you, at least those of you who know your Bible, because we believe 
that salvation is by grace. We, we believe, as we studied in the book of Jonah, that salvation is from the Lord. So, why is this verse here in the Bible telling me to achieve or to bring about my own salvation? Let's do a little um, four-minute theological sidebar here so I can help you understand what's going on a little more clearly. Biblically, the idea of salvation includes both justification and sanctification. Um, These are big theological terms that refer to two different aspects of the work of salvation. Let me contrast them briefly for you. Uh, In justification, I am declared righteous. In sanctification, I become righteous. In justification, justification is an event that takes place outside of me. Sanctification is a process that happens within me. Justification is a verdict, that is, it is legal. Think of it as the gavel coming down in the courtroom of heaven and God declaring you not guilty by virtue of the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is a transformation. It is ethical. It is the ongoing renovation of my character. Justification is once for all. Sanctification is progressive and ongoing. Uh, Justification is monergistic. It is God's work alone. Sanctification is synergistic. It is God's work and my work. Uh, Justification leads to sanctification and sanctification flows out of justification. So these two things can't really be uh, separated, but they can be distinguished. Okay. So the word salvation in the Bible is a vast word, it's sort of a sweeping word that encompasses both of these realities. Sometimes when the Bible speaks of salvation, it's looking back to the once for all declaration of justification that is mine in Christ. But sometimes when the Bible speaks of salvation, it's talking about the ongoing work of sanctification which continues in my life now. So so can we agree that one of the problems with Christianity in our culture, one of the great defeaters to the gospel in our culture, is that there are a number of people who claim to be saved, yet are not changed. Right? Um, I've talked to many non-Christians who say something to this effect. Look, if salvation is God supernaturally changing the human heart. If that's what you're telling me the gospel is, how come I know so many Christians who are just like everybody else? Friends, that's the problem this verse is speaking to. The Bible is saying those who have been saved show it by working out their salvation. Um, Or to say it another way, those who are saved by Jesus are also changed by Jesus. Those who are justified are also sanctified. Uh, God justifies the ungodly. That's what Romans 4 tells us. God comes to us and meets us while we are dead in sin. Before we move toward him, he moves toward us. He causes us to be born again. So he justifies us while we are ungodly. But he doesn't leave us ungodly. He he begins to work to change us, to transform us. And that ongoing work of transformation involves us. It involves our effort and our activity and our participation. There is work for us to do. So the starkness of this command is not accidental. This is the Bible sort of grabbing you by the collar and reminding you, hey, Salvation is not a past event. It's ongoing. It's also future. Bring about, achieve, work out your own salvation. This is supposed to wake you up from your sort of let go and let God passivity and remind you, hey, there, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. Change is our work. Now, if we've, if we've engaged this, the starkness of the command, let's, let's look secondly then at the substance of this command. I want to draw your attention first to the who and then to the how. Okay, So look first of all at who this is talking about. Work out your own salvation. Okay, 
So you English nerds will immediately notice this is a reflexive pronoun. Right? Work out your own salvation. In other words, no one can do the work of change for you. You have to take responsibility for your own sanctification, for your own transformation. You have to take ownership of your personal relationship with Christ. Listen, when every one of us does this, it makes for a beautiful church. Right? When each of us is working out our own salvation, what that creates is a gospel culture, a transformative culture, a vibrant spiritual culture. Not only that, but when we are working out our own salvation, it's out of that work that we're then able to help others on the path of sanctification as well. Right? Like, the more we know our own struggles and challenges in growth, the more we're able to serve and help others who face similar challenges. The less we're working out our own salvation, the less helpful we'll be to anyone else. Right? Yeah, so you guys, you guys have all had the people that really want to help you work out your salvation, but don't really want to work out their own, right? And we don't like those people. We call them sort of hypocrites, right? We like the people who out of their own relationship with the Lord and their own challenges of repentance and faith are willing then to help us move forward on the path of growth in Christ. That's what this verse is talking about. Change starts with you. Work out your own salvation. That's the who. The who is each of us starts with ourselves, okay? Second, notice the how. Uh, with fear and trembling. That, that's the how. how. How do we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? See, real change is anchored in the fear of God. Real change proceeds from a right apprehension of who God is. The high, holy, sovereign Lord of the universe. The uncreated creator. The absolute being who depends on nothing and no one for his existence. Who has all life and all glory and all goodness in himself. Listen to the writer Annie Dillard as she rebukes us for our bland God talk. She says this, On the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. She's saying, friends, we're dealing with the living God here. Do you understand what we're talking about? We don't work out our salvation with flippancy and half-heartedness. We work out our salvation with the worshipful reverence of those who have seen Mount Sinai trembling with the presence of God. Those who have heard of the fire falling from heaven when Elijah prayed and called on the name of God. Those who remember Ananias being struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit. Work out your salvation with fear. And trembling. Rooted in the holiness and seriousness of who God is. Who it is that we're dealing with here. Who it is we say we worship. So, we've seen the starkness of the command. The substance of the command. Well, let's not forget though the secret of this command. Remember that this entire exhortation hinges on the word for at the beginning of verse 13, right? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you 
both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So you see, the secret of this command is this. Pleasing God is what you most want. When God is at work in you, you want to do what pleases Him. Follow me here. There are a lot of Christians that have what I call an eat your vegetables approach to obedience and change. Um, you know when you were growing up and, and your mom was trying to help you develop a balanced diet and you would say things like, but mom, I don't like vegetables. And, and she might say something like this, eat them anyway, they're good for you, right? Um, that's how some of us approach change. I don't like this, but I guess I should do it because it'll be good for me. Right? No wonder that we can't sustain any sense of long-term change. No wonder that obedience to God seems rote and routine and dutiful to us. We're convinced that it's not what we really want, but it's good for us. But listen, last week I showed you that this little phrase in verse 13, for his good pleasure, means that God takes pleasure in us and takes pleasure in the work of changing us. So, first we need to see God delights in his people and he delights in the work of transforming us. But listen, this phrase also means that when God is at work in us, we delight in pleasing God. In fact, the New Living Translation renders the text this way. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. God is working in us, giving us the desire to please Him. So the secret of this command is, because God is at work, pleasing God is the thing we most want. Um, last year, during Lent, my family and I decided to... Um, Go on the Whole30 diet. If you're not familiar with it, it's a 30-day, it's a very, very restricted diet where you cut out all processed foods, all refined sugar, uh, all dairy. You basically trim your diet down to a very few, very natural, very whole foods. And the idea is to sort of hit reset on how your body does its metabolism and processes food and diet. So over the Lenten season, we did this together as a family. And here's what I can tell you. Um, for the first seven days, it's really terrible. Because you don't realize how much your body runs on uh, caffeine and processed sugar and all the things you take in that sort of you're not thinking much about. And so for the first few days, it's really not fun. But here's what happens. About day 10 or day 15, your body starts to sort of reset itself. And, and as you progress through this 30-day experiment, what you find is that um, things start to taste different. Like, um, sweet potatoes actually taste sweet. That's why they call them that. <laughs> they don't taste sweet in comparison to Coca-Cola, but in comparison to water, they really do have a, a sweetness to them, <laughs> right? Like, like, your taste buds just entirely reset, and, and your body begins to sort of work the way that God designed it to, meaning your palate begins to find flavors in food that you didn't taste before. Why? Because your palate had been reset by all the junk food that you've been eating, or that I've been eating. I'll just talk about myself here. I don't, I don't know. You guys are probably wonderful, clean eaters, all right? So, um, but, but that's what I noticed, is, is that you, you begin to go, oh, I think this is how it was made to taste food. Now, I, I don't want to, like, go all high and holy on the Whole30, right? It's a, it's a diet. It's good. You should try it, maybe. It's not from God. Um, but it is interesting to me how um, after that 30 days, if I drank a carbonated beverage, it almost tasted disgusting to me. It's just like, this is so sweet. It's so saturated with sugar. I haven't had sugar for 30 days, and now this just tastes different. It doesn't taste normal um, because you just sort of get reset. And, and here's, here's the point of that story. That's the same way that spiritual change works, right? Like, like sin is the processed sugar of your spiritual diet. 
Like you think it tastes good because you're made for something else and this is just a substitute. And so, of course, if that's what you've been tasting, it's sort of, you sort of have this sugar high, right? But, but as you begin to sort of reset yourself and understand how God designed you to live, all of a sudden you realize, oh, um, actually that doesn't taste the same anymore. Like I've got a new set of appetites and inclinations and desires. The Spirit of God is resetting me in ways that help me crave and desire what I was made for in the first place. That's how change works. The secret of this command is, listen, God is at work in you, and so that means you actually desire what God desires for you. And this is the nature of change, right? That diet example is a great analogy for all change. Here's what all change feels like. Terrible for the first seven days, right? If you're trying to quit smoking, it's going to be terrible. If you're trying to quit drinking, it's going to be terrible. If you're trying to quit arguing or lying or gossiping, it's going to feel terrible. Whatever you're trying to change in your life, it always gets worse before it gets better. And so what most of us do is we bail out about day six, and we're like, well, this isn't going anywhere. This is just not working, right? Here's what I can tell you. Um, you have to go through that to experience change. And if you will persist in the difficulty of change, in those moments where it feels really hard, here's what you'll find on the other side of that. You'll find yourself coming alive to all the things you were meant to live for in the first place. Like all the ways God designed you to experience joy and delight and fullness and freedom and life. That's what you're made for. So the secret to this command is not like, hey, gut it out, work it out, keep working hard. The secret is um, work out your own salvation be faithful and committed to the work of change because here's the deal. God's at work in you and what you most want is what he wants. Yeah. Uh, I want you to notice, right, notice how full of gospel this whole text is. And notice that it is not saying, uh, hey, work out your salvation so you can gain points with God. Work out your salvation so you can feel better about yourself. Work out your salvation so all the Christians around you will notice and think you're doing a really great job. And what it says is, work out your salvation with fear and trembling out of the fear of God. Why? Well, because God's already at work in you. The Spirit of God is already at work in you, changing you, transforming you, freeing you, resetting your desires and inclinations and longings. And so, rooted in the grace of God, which is already at work through the, through the ministry of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Work out your salvation. This text is grounded in gospel truth from beginning to end. So even as we embrace this morning that change is our work, let's hear that grounded in gospel promises. Right? Change is our work because God is at work. Change is our work. We're free to do it. Why? Because the Spirit is at work in us already changing us. What you really want is what God wants because the Spirit is at work changing your desires. So, so persist. Pursue, lean into the work of change. Now, I'll close with this. If change is your work, what should you be doing? Like, what, are, what is the work you should practically be giving yourself to? Um, this is where, like, people can get really prescriptive and give you all kinds of, here's what you should do, you should do this and do that. There might be a different recipe for every single one of you in the room, but here's what I'll tell you. There are three simple and primary means of grace that God will use to change every one of us. And so, whatever the recipe, whatever the sort of plan is for change in your life, it's going to involve these three things in some fashion. Here they are. Scripture, prayer, and community, or fellowship, or the people of God. Um, if you want to change, you've got to be taking in the Bible consistently. You've got to be feasting your mind and heart on God's truth. You've got to be conforming your thinking to the way God says the world is. You've got to learn to live in line with reality, and that involves copious amounts of Scripture that reset the way you see the world. So look, you're not going to change apart from a steady diet of the Bible. And so consider that as one of the means you've got to put to work in your life for any kind of change to take place. 
Christians are to be a people of the book. We're to be a people who are reading, listening to, hearing, meditating on the Word of God. Uh, One simple tool that we have tried to provide as a resource for that is the Daily Liturgy podcast, which is 12 to 15 minutes a day of just Scripture coming into your earbuds. Uh, Consider that as a practice if that would be helpful to you in the work of change in your life. Second, if you want to change, you've got to be cultivating communion with God through prayer. Um, Learning the language of communication with the living God. Listen, prayer is hard. Do you know why? Because it's a language. It's like learning any foreign language. Rosetta Stone doesn't work overnight, right? There's a reason you took three years of high school Spanish and you still can't order a, a burrito, right? Uh, Second languages are not easy, okay? Uh, Prayer is the same way. Prayer takes diligence. It takes patience. It's learning the language of divine human communication, which is why the people of God persist in it and why it is foundational to all kinds of spiritual change. And listen, one of the reasons I'm so um, excited about cutting out social media during Advent is because it's just going to free up space for prayer, for learning a language other than Thumbs up, heart, right? But, but a language of prayer, a language of communication with God. After the new year begins, we're going to start again a rhythm that we've had uh, for a number of years here called First Wednesday Worship and Prayer, where the first Wednesday of every month, we're going to invite the church to get together for a time of worship and a time of prayer. You'll hear more about that in the weeks to come. But I want to invite you to consider making that part of your rhythm. Not the only time that you pray, but one of the times that you pray with other And third, if you want to change, you've got to be in community. The kind of real, meaningful, um, close-grained community where people really know you and you really know them. Uh, In fact, I I hesitated to even use the word community here because it's sort of become a buzzword where people, everybody loves community, right? Um, But what I'm talking about is a kind of deep um, spiritual friendship. That, that allows us to really know and be known. And that is um, open to those outside of the church to invite them to, to come in and get a taste of what real, deep, powerful community is really like. Um, no one changes in isolation. We are made and designed for community, for relationship with God and with others. And one of the foundational tools and means that God uses to apply His grace in our lives is just this simple framework of fellowship, relationships. That's part of what we're doing here this morning. We're here together. This is an expression of the worship of God communally. This shouldn't be the only expression of community in your life, which is why we sort of always are urging you toward gospel community, toward a smaller network of relationships throughout the week that provide for you a a groundedness and a centering point for the work of change. So so listen, all I'm trying to say here is all these things play out in a bunch of different ways in our lives, but the Bible, prayer, and community are foundational means of God's grace in our lives. We cannot change apart from these things. We will not change spiritually apart from these things. And so, again, there may be tons of other things that each of us needs to do when it comes to repentance and faith and growth, but it will likely involve some combination, some blending, some discipline in all those two areas. Listen, the reason that the great theological fathers and mothers who came before us talked so much about spiritual disciplines is because these are the things that bring about change. And look, here's here's what's funny to me. We know this in every other area of life right? Like, you know, to get good at a sport, it takes a ton of discipline and practice. Or to learn to play an instrument, it takes a ton of discipline and practice. Or to get good at a craft or at a vocation, it takes a lot of training and mentorship and practice. And somehow we assume that spiritual change is magic. It's not. Spiritual change 
comes about through the same kind of spiritual disciplines that we give ourselves over to that then form and shape us in particular ways. And so why do we take in the Bible and prayer? Not as ends in themselves, but as means that shape us and form us as disciplines that begin to shape the fabric of our hearts and our lives in certain ways that turn us into a certain kind of people. That's the point. So look, the scriptures, the Apostle Paul wants you to hear, if you do nothing, probably nothing will change. Um, God is at work in you, but he is at work renewing your desires and activating your will. So God's work in you and your work are not separate things. They are intimately and closely connected. Change is active, not passive. So it requires our earnest effort. And as we go about giving that effort, giving ourselves over to the work of change, that's not something we're doing apart from God. But that is, in fact, God working in us. Now listen to this great conclusion uh, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, this blessing. Hang on, i got to find Hebrews. There we go. Um, now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Okay, so catch the language of doing there. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. So you catch the same balance there, right? May God work in you that which is pleasing so that you may do his will. Change is God's work and change is your work. And these things are not separate. They are intimately connected. And so let's pray and ask the Lord to further this work of change in our souls. Would you join me? So our God, we thank you that you have built us as creatures who are capable of activity and of intention. And we acknowledge that one of the things this text confronts is our passivity and our tendency to just sort of sit back and assume that change is magic. So Father, we invite you to remind us this morning of the activeness that is required for any intentional deep change. And not only that, but we thank you that you are already at work in us by your spirit so that the things we delight in and desire are the things you delight in and desire. Would you deepen the work of your spirit in our hearts and awaken our slumbering wills that we might be more purposeful in seeking the things that please you, in pursuing obedience and a life that brings you glory in putting to death the deeds of the flesh in us and bringing to life the virtue of the Spirit. God, thank you that we are invited to this work because you are at work in us. Deepen your work in us and deepen our work by your grace and for your glory. Amen.